Now we have an esteemed panel up here for you today, which we're going to jump to in a minute. But I'm the warm-up act to get a little audience participation going as we kick this off. And so I'm going to need a show of hands from people. And I want you to raise your hands as we go along, starting with a basic question, which is, how many of you have experienced frustration when you push that Uber app, you're waiting for the car that you thought was going to be there in three minutes, and it takes you five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Raise your hand if, you've, if you'll admit to a little bit of frustration. Keep your hands in the air. What about when you're on that flight and your Wi-Fi cuts out? That email that you're about to send or that page that you're viewing gets a little jittery. Or worse than that, you were told there's Wi-Fi on the flight and for some reason it's not available. Raise your hands. Okay, one more. When you're on Amazon or another e-commerce site and you see that it's, it can be delivered tomorrow and you're excited, you're about to hit buy now, and yet right as you're about to order it, it switches over to the next day and suddenly you have to wait 36 hours instead of 12 hours for that item. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced any of that frustration. How spoiled are all of we? <laughs> I'm going to make the case it's a great thing, don't get me wrong. But consumers and customers today expect greatness. We see it in the consumer apps that we use every day on our mobile phones. Whether it's crowdsource navigation from apps like Waze, whether it's communication from the Snapchats of the world, etc. Whether it's instant video on demand on just about any device in just about any location. You can now get food pre-sorted and sent to you unassembled, you can get a turnkey raw ingredients assembled, or even an entire meal delivered on your doorstep from a variety of restaurants and a variety of vendors. And that's starting to make its way into the enterprise world. A shout out, we have the box team. Or, uh, you've got apps that you, you can now get content and collaboration across a variety of devices in just about any location. You can sign documents from beaches. <laughs> Round of applause for the uh, DocuSign and, and the e-signature wave. And you can now see inside your sales and marketing reports, a shout out to Umberto and Inside View, who we're going to hear from shortly. You get network acceleration, a round of applause for Riverbeds, and we're going to hear from Jerry shortly around uh, bringing this technology to you through SaaS acceleration, network acceleration, and the speed and access that you and your customers have come to, to demand, as well as enabling services and communications platforms like Twilio that make things like Uber happen. A round of applause for Twilio and Jeff Lawson, who we'll hear from shortly. Your customers are now in charge. Get used to it, embrace it. The on-demand revolution is upon us. And we're very fortunate to hear from three of the unicorn leaders in this revolution. For you today, we've got Jerry from Riverbed, who was as of last Friday, our designated public unicorn, but has taken his multi-billion dollar public company private, so he now joins the ranks of the multi-billion dollar, not only market cap, but also revenue uh, CEOs. We have Umberto from Inside View, who's a past public unicorn executive, and now a future unicorn private company executive, CEO. And Jeff Lawson with Twilio, one of the hot private uh, unicorns in the cloud ecosystem. So we're going to dive into a Q&A with them. I encourage you, if you have questions in the audience when we get, once we get started, please don't be shy. But we're going to lead off with Jerry. And after all those accolades, um, I'm going to ask you to give us an embarrassing story and ask the group to start with actually your fumble. Uh, give us a customer success horror story. People in the room have had them. They live them every day. Tell us the unicorn multi-billion dollar horror stories, please. Yeah, I guess uh, I reckon that would be the, uh, the sneak attack. So. Uh, you know, we sell a product that makes a customer's network blazingly fast and very cheap. It's pretty reliable, but if there's a perfect storm of events, uh, it can actually slow a network down or cause a problem. And, um, you know, we're pretty good at supporting it, knowing what's going on in, with our customers, but often we sell through distribution partners, and sometimes the distribution partner stands between us and the customer, so we don't always see what's going on. So I was uh, in Switzerland uh, meeting a global 100 international um, insurance company, huge company, who had been an early adopter, and their CIO had taken a big chance because we were new at that time, and he had bought, bought our product through a gigantic uh, service provider, Telcom, in Europe. Uh, 
who took the lead in installing it. So I was invited to the office of the CIO, a uh, multi-million dollar customer, you know, trillion dollar uh, market cap. And I walked in, you know, with the, uh, the head of the uh, tel telco in Switzerland and I, my country manager in Switzerland. And the Swiss are beautiful people and I was expected to be kind of a love fest, howdy type of meeting with the customer. We walked in and uh, the next hour was probably the worst business hour of my entire career because uh, unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to our Swiss uh, country manager from Riverbed, the, the service provider had totally fumbled the rollout of the product, had been delayed in delivering it, they had used poor staff to install it, the support was horrible, the CIO had taken a big chance and bet his career on this, was humiliated in front of his peers, and he sat there and for an hour chewed the hell out of all three of us. Uh, and this is a complete surprise. The Swiss are wonderful people, but um, you know, they make watches that are very precise. You know, the trains run on time. You know, when Heidi and grandfather are milking the cow, the cheese is perfect, right? And so they had very low tolerance for uh, uh, anything wrong with software appliances, and uh, it was just uh, a horrible, disheartening, degrading meeting on the one hand. On the other hand, though, what happens is when you have a, a bad customer situation that's gone bad, and you, that gives you the chance to handle it, and if you can recover, regain the confidence of the customer, the fact that you went through a rough patch together and came out successful the other side, it's actually like making a buddy in a foxhole in war. That person becomes sort of your friend for life. And so you can turn an ugly customer situation into something that actually bears fruit for many years. And so the main thing is you know, not, not to die on the spot when you're pre presented with a situation like this, but to grab it, handle it, uh, take it forward, get it resolved, get them back up and running, get it stable, and you've got a friend for life. And did you get the upsell? They've been a customer for many years. They have a small subsidiary in the U.S., a tiny part of the business. I think it's called the Farmer's Insurance or something, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out okay. Yeah. Jeff Umberto, any uh, war wound you're willing to share? Well, I have to be careful because my customer success team, some of them are here, so I can't <laughs> throw anybody under the bus. Um, but let's say that it's possible that just recently one of our customer success team a uh, member sent an email to a customer saying, Dear Bob, I'm checking in to see how you're doing with our product. And his answer back was, you know, I'm having this problem, that problem, that problem. And by the way, my name is Mike. <laughs> Oops. Uh, you know, I guess my story, it's really interesting. You know, I'm a developer. We started this company for developers. And developers have this funny point of view. They just think, you know, it's technology. It should work. And the whole goal of the whole exercise is to never interact with another human being. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started the company in this way. And, um, yeah, I remember early on, one of our big customers, it was a, it was a, a smaller company, but they became a big customer. And you know the technology was worked great, and you know we we had, you know we had a customer success person, but like we just didn't spend a lot of time with the customer because everything was working. We just assumed everything was fine. And I was out; they were out on the East Coast. I was on the East Coast, and so I said, oh, "I'll just stop by and, and say hello, schedule a time to meet." And I go over there, and they and, and we walk. He's like, "Let's go take a walk," and we take a walk around New York, and he says, "You know, Tulio is working great for us." but I don't think, I don't feel like we're important to you. And I said, oh, well, why is that? You're very important. They were like one of our top five revenue customers. And he says, well, you never call. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I'm sort of like, well, you know, we're a startup. This is pretty, it's pretty busy. Um, you know, you don't, like, everything's working. Like, why would I call you? And it was like sort of literally like a, like, that seems like unnecessary human interaction, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a kind of an early lesson for like I literally like didn't understand like you know I know that like in, in, in business like people buy stakes for each other like there's that thing and they like will go they'll, they'll play golf together for some reason <laughs> um, but <laughs> it was like an early indicator of like no like there's more to this than just the technology the technology working the technology solving a problem like there's a relationship to B2B and this is the first B2B company that I've ever started I've done three consumer companies prior to Twilio, and so that was a real interesting learning for me. Yeah. 
And we're working through uh, this together in the sense of not only are there new business models within cloud, but customer success itself is fairly new. And so, Umberto, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about your org model, if you could, and how you've set up customer success. But let me give a little more context first uh, to stay with the baseball theme. Umberto's pinch hitting for us. You saw Keith Kroc on the agenda uh, as well. DocuSign announced their uh, mega unicorn financing today of uh, a quarter billion dollars. And so um, uh, Keith was, was sorry, sent his regards. Umberto was a longtime uh, friend and champion of customer success and a guru of this uh, sector. And so he's pinch hitting for us and uh, quite opinionated on the subject. And so uh, can you give us a little bit of a setup in terms of how you think through customer success within a company uh, should be structured and how you've chosen to do it? And Keith is sending me a check for an amount of his fundraising. The, in the baseball theme, the agent fee, we'll work on that. You know, for us, it's, it's been an evolution, and it's a never-ending evolution, frankly. I think one of my takeaways from customer success is your cu you go to market changes, your customers change, and you better be changing your customer success model to reflect what success means for the customer today, not a year ago, two years ago. So at the beginning, customer success was under sales. You know, first of all, sales people sold the deal and then they were like, people would call and they would take the calls and they would do their best. And then we started specializing people, put them under sales. And today it's a dedicated function, reports to me um, and has a very different perspective, which is really about, you know, customer success and, you know, net promoter score and, and really understanding post-sale what we need to do to help the customer. And that's, I think, one of the common themes in technology is just because you build it, it does not mean that the world knows what to do with it, right? And you need to really figure out how do you help the market adopt whatever you're doing. And usually there's some level of change management. In other words, if you're doing something innovative uh, and it's different and you keep using it the same way that you use, use the old technology and that you're not really leveraging uh, and taking advantage. And sales organizations are too busy to deal with that. They're like, you know, next deal, next deal, next deal. And you know, the, I think it's important to have somebody at the executive table who is continually pounding the table and saying, this is what our, our customers want, which might be different than what you hear in the sales cycle. And it might be different when you hear from a support perspective, but this is what we should be doing as a company to help all of our customers leverage our technology more effectively. Right. And you said that person is a direct report to you, an executive level position. Yeah, and so it's a peer to the head of sales and the head of product and the head of finance. And I think that's where, in a company where, you know, today, so this year in 2015, um, more than 50% of our booking sales revenue is going to come from existing relationships, right? So you cannot have half of your revenue not represented at the table, I don't think. Absolutely. Now, Jerry, Riverbed has a mix of heavy perpetual model with some sub subscription and some maintenance and support elements to it. Yeah. So a little different hybrid structure. Um, give us a sense of how you've chosen to organize it. So um, we look at the, the, the subscription part of our business is really what we call maintenance. So maintenance is uh, people pay 20% of the license fee every year forever exchange for which they get uh, the right to upgrade to the software, which is 75% of the value. Then they get break, break fix on the software and hardware, which is 25% of the value. So it's really uh, an annual subscription to software upgrades th to the product. It's a very important. Um, you know, we run that as a separate business unit to drive revenue growth and profitability, but they depend on uh, constant innovation from the engineering group to make updates so you get value from the, from the, from the upgrade. So uh, it works very well. We, we, we don't really have a model where we're delivering um, SaaS uh, services from our own data center. That's a very capital intensive model and uh, it's a different kind of business. We, we're customers of those things. And uh, you know, I have some good stories. One of the issues there is that um, you know, we, we built our whole company from start to a billion dollars on just $30 million of capital, uh, start to finish, right? As you just mentioned, uh, uh, DocuSign just raised a quarter billion dollars of capital. So you have to wonder, what do they do with all that money? It's because, because they have to build big data centers, big server farms that have the capacity to service uh, their SaaS customers. And we were early SaaS customers of uh, Oracle and, and Salesforce years ago when all this was just starting. And, and the problem was they figured it out now. Now it's fine. But, but seven or eight years ago, um, these server farms would be uh, resourced for average load, not for peak load. And uh, when you're running a business, everyone has peak load at the same time, which is the last 
month of the quarter, and everyone has the same last month of the quarter. It's March, it's June, it's September, and so the uh, SaaS providers would run out of processing horsepower in the last week of your quarter. If you're, you're a public company, uh, if, it, if those programs don't work, you can't ship your product, which means you can't book your revenue, which means you miss your quarter as a public company. So that becomes an existential problem for you as a, as a customer. Um, an existential problem is something that can put you out of business. So, you know, the great definition is that a nuclear bomb for Iran is an existential problem for Israel because a single bomb hitting a single city, Tel Aviv, destroys the country of Israel, right? And so a SaaS provider whose product is required to close your books and make your shipments in the last week of your quarter, if they fail, you know, you're screwed, right? So, and, so th this so, gets interesting. I think we yeah, have a little yeah. point counterpoint on cloud, and so I'm going to give Jeff the opportunity to respond in the customer success context, which is one of the negatives of cloud absolutely is horrible financial setup, which is all of your costs are front-loaded, revenue is back-loaded, and that you, by gap rules, you have to amortize it over time. However, one of the beauties is you wake up tomorrow with the business you had yesterday and you're building on it. And so, Jeff, can you give us some setup in terms of how you think through account management renewals growing your accounts? Where oftentimes you hear about businesses that uh, they look for net negative churn, you know, upsells in the 5% range. Are you willing to share any of the a sense for how Twilio thinks about account growth and how you think about growing your business tomorrow and the next day off of the base of yesterday? Yeah, we have probably the exact opposite model than what you just described at Riverbed, right? Because ours is, like, there is no step function. Like, at most companies with a, a well-established sales process, and, and especially true in the on-prem world, where you'd say, like, here you're not a customer, right? then you sign a contract and write a check, and now suddenly you're a customer, right? And there's this binary, like, not a customer, customer, ring the bell moment, right? And for us, it is a completely self-service uh, model where customers come in, sign up, get started using it, and where this is a little different even from software as a service that we're accustomed to with the self-service model is that our revenue is a usage-based model. So it is, uh, uh, it is a function of how much of our product you use that uh, is how much you pay. And so the idea is that you, everybody starts out by spending their first penny on Twilio. Penny is the minimum skew for us. And, and then it just goes up from there. And it's a variable equation whether or not tomorrow you're going to spend one more penny or $100 or $1,000 or $100,000. Uh, and so it's really this, this variable model. And so we've, uh, we've tried a lot of different models to try to figure out like where in the life cycle to insert our processes in order to make the customers successful. Right, because you could come in the door and a Gmail address that signs up and starts using Twilio uh, could be a developer in the dorm room, which is fantastic, or it could be you know, a vice president of IT at, I don't know, Merrill Lynch, right? And, it, and we have no idea. Our job, as we see it, is regardless of who is behind that, say, Gmail address, um, we want to make you successful. Um, and because we don't know. Right, and so customer success is really like the whole life cycle, and there isn't a specific sales portion and a support portion and a customer success portion. Uh, it really is all wrapped up in like one continuous evolution of the relationship with the customer. And so the way we think about it, our job is to provide great support for customers, and that's usually more in terms of technical support, but sometimes it's business-oriented support. Uh, but it's a, there's a fascinating distinction that's always bugged me a lot in the sales versus support distinction. So, I mean, I guess I'm not sure. How many people here are like in support organizations? Is anybody? Is, is everybody here sales? It's like one little crowd over there. So there's this interesting thing, right? We have a support organization, very technical. In fact, our support organization lives in our engineering department. Like with the people who build our product, that's where our support team lives because they're supporting this highly technical product. And we have this internal SLA where anybody who writes into our support, even if you're on the free tier of support, and even if you've not even spent your first penny yet, right, we have this internal SLA that we want to give a great experience to you because it's always a pre-sale or customer sat issue for us. And so we have this internal SLA, I think it's four business hours uh, you know, during, during business hours, 
that we want to get a, get a reply to you. And everybody in the organization has bought in that this is a good thing for customers. Right? So if you write in with a question, you'll get an answer back, even if you haven't paid us a penny. Right? On the flip side, we have a forum on our website that says contact sales. And you fill it out, and that goes into you know, like Salesforce and gets into queues, and we've got business development representatives to then follow up with that. And time after time, I'd see customers on Twitter say things like, hey, I reached out to sales two weeks ago and I never heard back. Right, because the way sales operates is this isn't a customer whose satisfaction I care about, this is a lead. And a lead may be valuable or not valuable. And so a salesperson might have gotten this lead and said, oh, this doesn't look like a valuable lead, I'm gonna deprioritize it. And weeks could go by and you wouldn't hear back. But isn't that a fascinating distinction? Where if you fill out this form, everybody in the organization is like, we've gotta take care of you. And you have not told us you're gonna spend a penny. Whereas over here, when you're raising your hand saying, I wanna spend money, can I talk to a salesperson? It gets routed and a salesperson can say, ah, I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> right, not get back to you. And so I think one of the things that we've always tried to do, again, with this like continuous evolution model that we have, is to try to break down this distinction between like, you're not a customer, you are a customer. Like, who should get treated well, who should not? And it's tough, and we're doing it at scale. Um, we have over 600,000 developers on our platform, and we're adding over 30,000 every month. And so we have to treat every single one of those is essentially both a customer, a lead, and a customer sat, you know, potential that we have to service. And I don't know how many people here measure NPS scores, but our NPS score is a plus 69. Yep. Which is exceptional. Right, and so despite the fact that like we always have this clusterfuck of what sales and what support, and we're always trying to figure out a better model, the end result is I think we're taking care of customers well. And then, Umberto, you're sort of in between, in this case literally, but also figuratively, um, in terms of model, where you've yeah. got a... I think I'm actually the only one here who's a customer success team, so thank God I showed up, otherwise <laughs> we'd have had a really depressing panel here. Hey, I suspect uh, the, the, the team title uh, for you, Jerry, are they account management? Is that the function internally? Uh, no, we call it support. Okay, so you've got a distinction between sa the yeah. sales, the upsells, and then support. Yeah. And then, Umberto, two questions within this. One, highlight the distinction in terms of how you break apart functions with your customer yeah. service, your uh, customer success, or service and support, customer success, and then sales. And then, can you talk about the art of this handoff? When an account goes from a closed deal to an implemented customer to a ongoing sustaining yep. customer and how you think about the handoffs and even maybe give us some sense into the, the economic models of, of how are people compensated along that journey because that sure. does drive time sure. and behavior. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that we have such different models and I think it's uh, depending on what kind of solution you're selling. So we are selling a different way of selling and marketing, right? We're not selling a cheaper way to do what you've always done. We're selling, you're gonna do something fundamentally different with our information and hence be more effective. And I think Gainsight is in the same type of business. And I, I don't think you can do that and just say, here's the technology, Mr. Customer Go. And I think it's forcing us to help our customer be successful with that model. Or if you're just addressing a developer that already knows that they need to do some telephony stuff and all of that and you're just giving them something better, cheaper, then you don't necessarily are trying to change what they're doing, you're just trying to help them do it more effectively and I think that drives the, the change. The handoff and the role of, to your second question, the handoff and the role of sales is a tricky one because ultimately we've, uh, I would say 90% of our customers we have not yet reached full penetration, full deployment, right? So we're always selling. And we're not selling like, you know, we want to, selling sometimes has a bad connotation, but in my mind, selling is I'm, I'm always looking for ways I can help you more. I have not yet reached the ultimate goal, which is you are s using our technology so effectively that your revenue conversion rates, your growth, everything else has been accelerated as much as I think it can accelerate. So then you kind of want people in there who are helping the customer get value out of the initial purchase, but you also are looking for people in there who can keep talking to the customer and say, by the way, you know, we tackled your sales organization with you, but have you really thought about how marketing and lead gen should connect into sales, and are they using the same information, and is there a consistent flow? And by the way, what are you doing with their customer systems? Have those been updated? You have APIs that keep those up to date. 
So you're always having that conversation. It, so in terms of ownership, how does that evolve though? And so what do you consider a sale? When does um, your sales team hand it off? Who do they hand it over to? And yep. how does the, the compensation ownership model change? Yep. So initial, uh, new, what we call new logo, brand new customer, yep. uh, customer signs. There's a handoff between the salesperson who says, here are the reasons the customer bought. They want to do this, this, and this, and that. And hopefully it's a bunch of business outcomes, not a bunch of features. The customer success person looks at that and says, either yes, I can, we can do that, or B, it's like, oh, we have a problem here because you know, they want to go to the moon and we don't take people to the moon, so let's have a conversation and clarify. From then on, then the customer success person owns the success of that account and making sure that they're happy and also is in there listening for, it, can we do more for this customer? And then if they see, hey, I can do more, you know, we're helping them in marketing and we can help them in sales, then if it's appropriate, brings a salesperson back in to then have a conversation about expanding the relationship. So that's where we draw the line. It's different depending whether we are in our volume business, which is very low touch versus a uh, what we call a global account, which is very high touch, and then there's you know there are different segments that go up and down um, that are handled in a slightly different way. And you have overlapping compensation models throughout that evolution, so sales and, and yeah. customer so success. So in general, we double pay. So yeah. if a customer expands, the customer success person gets compensated on that, and the salesperson gets compensated on that uh, in general. Okay. With and with some exceptions. And then you actually alluded to my next question, which um, uh, Jerry and Jeff, uh, as well. You can't treat all customers equally uh, as much right. as you'd like to, and, and frankly, they don't deserve to all be treated equally. They have different needs and they represent different value, and from a margin perspective and a resourcing perspective, you've got to make trade-offs yep. in a world of scarce resources internally. And so, um, maybe, Jerry, if you could lead us off, how do you think through that matrix of how do you resource customers, both from a support side in your case and also from a sales side? Sure. <coughs> well, we do a customer segmentation, so our target is the global 2000. We have 26,000 customers, but our target are the global 2,000, what we call A and B accounts. And we uh, assign major account managers who, you know, are people who nurture that customer, uh, try to penetrate further. They never let go, it never is turned away from them. They, they own that account uh, permanently. Typically, one of those guys will have 10 to 20, no more than 20, usually 10 large accounts that they take care of. Um, then the lower, the, the B accounts are more uh, large companies that are in a geog geographical territory. So you have a, geog a geographical territory sales guy that, that handles those together with a sales engineer who's a technical person who supports them. They go after that business, that's theirs. Everything below that we call a C account and then we have uh, uh, 300 channel distribution partners that go after the SMB and the, um, the smaller mid-tier accounts. And, uh, and they're, they're very good at, at, at that. Uh, the support organizations, have, uh, is ancillary. We also have a professional services consulting organization. Both those two organizations uh, work with the account manager uh, to achieve further penetration and, and the satisfaction of the customer. Um, and they get paid on, on, on different metrics. Um, and we, do, we do some double paying, uh, but then you have double quota, so it all e evens out. But uh, hey, uh, And then, and just to be clear, when you say A, B, and C, is that by Customer size by customer size to you, or potential customer size to potential you? Customer size, potential customer size. Okay, so customer. it's the opportunity, is yes, the size and potential size, value yes. of that account to you. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then Jeff, again, different model, but how do you think through uh, different levels of, of support and sales engagement and success engagement for your 500,000, 600,000 now plus customers? So how do we, like, slice, how do we categorize customers? How do you resource? Um, do you choose to make phone support and, and phone um, success available to everyone? Do you have, do you route some people to email only? Do you have well, um, you know, personal visits right? for strategic accounts? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, support plans starting at free, which is, you know, no committed SLA, even though we have our internal one, to, you know, adding SLAs and adding the phone option and all sorts of things like that. And an interesting thing happened. We added those plans like three years ago or whatever it was, and we actually looked at the, the revenue from it because the customers that mattered the most, right, they actually did have salespeople generally attached to those accounts. And what ended up happening is one by one, they'd and all end up getting kind of like comped support. Uh, and so the system kind of built itself, wherein the salesperson said, I want to make sure the customer's taken care of, but again, we're a very technical product, so usually that means that they need technical help 
right? Not a sales help per se. And so we kind of had outsourced customer success to our support team, our technical support team. But then we said, well, we can't give everybody the same support. Let's let customers opt in by, pay by paying for tiers of support. And then the salespeople kind of co-opted that to say, no, 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 it's okay, you're really important, I'll just comp it for you, right? <laughs> so we had this tiered structure that appeared out of nowhere. Uh, and so, <laughs> so we recently changed that model and we ended up, we, we, we kept the price tags, we actually made them more meaningful and actually applied a, uh, maybe this is our CSM, uh, a named technical uh, manager to your account with the top tier but then we took care of this notion of like, well, yeah, if you are a big customer of ours, we don't think you should, we think you should get a better quality of service from us from that support perspective. Um, so we actually created a system whereby based on your uh, tiers of spend, you got an automatic discount on support. Uh, and an email goes out to you when you hit a certain tier of revenue and it says, hi, based on your tier of revenue, you qualify for this uh, upgraded support plan. Click here to sign up, including up to a comped plan. But we said, let's not make this ad hoc. Uh, let's actually make this systematic so that customers, based on their spend with us, uh, can upgrade their support offering at their own pace. Interesting. Umberto, could you share how you think through stratifying both your success org and how you service customers? Do you have a two-by-two -two matrix of value to you and opportunity to you or something of that sort? Yeah, and maybe if I, if just a thought that it's going to escape my mind if I don't go to it uh, before I answer that question, which is, uh, you know, I think in f most business people who are the buyers for us, maybe different from you, most business people really want outcomes, right? They, they, that's all that they care about. And so if you can convince the market that you're investing in customer success to help them achieve outcome, that to me becomes a huge differentiation in the sales process because reality is most technology from a customer perspective, it all like, or most services all look the same. Consulting all looks the same, outsourcing all looks the same, you know, routers, uh, information, it all looks the same for a distance. So if you can convince the customer that you have a better customer success model, I think that can be super, super valuable, especially if you can point to actual customer success that that drove. From a segmentation perspective, we mostly look at it from a uh, uh, opportunity size to inside view. Although, you know, a large enterprise that is making a very small commitment to inside view is not going to get the same level of engagement that, say, a mid-sized company that's making a larger level of commitment. Just because it, to us it means that we have not yet gotten to the right point in the large enterprise, so we don't want to necessarily invest until we know that we have the right relationship. So we could have a super large customer being handled in the smallest tier just because we have not gotten that level of spend and engagement with them yet. Excellent. So let's take the conversation up from what's mainly been a domestic discussion uh, to the international lens. And I'd be curious for your thoughts on globalization from two perspectives. Uh, one is lessons learned from supporting global customers and, and um, interacting with them on how do you grow those accounts, how do you build the relationships, how do you drive account management, customer success, um, when you've got geographic limitations in there. And then the second is hiring. How do you think through what is, uh, by all accounts, a, a very hot and frothy market, particularly for our Bay Area uh, audience members here, uh, thinking about uh, other geos for large centers of, of team excellence, whether it's um, you know across all, any of these three functions that we've discussed, the customer service um, and support, customer success, or net new sales. Uh, maybe Jerry is the largest company with the billion in revenue, maybe you can start. Yeah, we're 45% uh, international, in fact. Uh, yeah, our first office was San Francisco, our second sales office was New York, our third was Seoul, Korea, believe it or not, and our fourth was um, London. So t uh, tech is a global business, it's an international business. Um, tech is primarily dominated by U.S. C companies, and so uh, both customers and uh, employees worldwide outside the United States think in terms of buying U.S. tech, because that's the norm, because uh, we're the leader in that industry. And, and it's funnily not a lot different outside the U.S. There are tech people who talk funny or talk a different language, right? Uh, not talking. Um, so it, the recruiting is pretty much the same. Um, the customer need is the same. Most of our customers, our product is a global product. It's used to connect 
uh, a customer's network for his offices all around the world, and our target customers are global companies that have offices in you know, South Africa and Tokyo and London and New York and Los Angeles and Geneva. Uh, and so actually we have to have that global presence in order for our value prop to work with our big customers. And sorry, which functions did you put globally and when? So when you talk about international Yeah, yeah so uh, you put mean? them all, you put them all globally uh, as fast as you can. And so, uh, uh, you know, support is very key very early. You, you do what's follow the sun. The sun goes, you know, the earth goes around the sun and you have to have support 24 hours a day. So uh, we have support in, um, in San Francisco at our headquarters, then it goes to Tokyo, and as the sun keeps moving, it goes to Singapore. From Singapore, it goes to Bangalore. From Bangalore, it goes to Amsterdam. From Amsterdam, it goes to New York City, then back to San Francisco, as the world revolves every day around the world. And we have uh, four language speakers in all those offices appropriate. But the offices hand off to each other, and so when San Francisco is asleep, and a customer calls into our support center, he's automatically routed to uh, Bangalore or, um, or Amsterdam. So, so you have to be able to deal with a, a global uh, population that needs support 24 hours a day, no matter where they are in the world. Market, marketing, you need some localization, some local language uh, uh, collateral. That, that's less important because, again, the, the, the tech world, it's like the airline world, it's, it's the English-speaking world uh, globally, but if you want to really expand, particularly in the Japan and, and China, uh, you need to get the local language going uh, at some point. Uh, okay. And then with the account management and sales, have you put in-country resources, local language speakers? Absolutely, as, okay. as fast as you can. So, you know, uh, the account manager in Dusseldorf looks a lot like the account manager in, in Cincinnati. Uh, only drinks more beer, probably. <laughs> God bless him. I, I love Oktoberfest. <laughs> Jeff, similar question. Twilio has been able to support global customers from day one, but has been um, only over the last couple of years have you opened international offices. Can you share some lessons learned with, with the audience there? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, as it, as it turns out, the world is now global. Um, and so we've done, I, I think, the standard thing, right? We've opened international offices to put, uh, you know, native language speakers in the time zones uh, to, for the customers that we are both selling to and supporting. Uh, so fairly standard. I don't think there's anything crazy about what we've done. Um, and we've gone in the past six months from having essentially, you know, two offices to having eight. So we've expanded that very quickly and a lot of that is in the sales, uh, sales marketing and support functions. Okay. Now, in terms of advice to the audience members, um, I'd like to ask it on two levels. And maybe Umberto, we'll start with you in terms of for CSM practitioners in the audience as well as executives. Um, what are the lessons learned in terms of you implementing this and elevating it as a CEO level uh, direct report function? Um, what's important to them in terms of building their case for the function, in terms of metrics that they should report on and career development for them to be relevant not only to the C-suite but also to the board? And then for um, Jerry and Jeff, in addition to that, just thinking through um, company building questions. We've got a lot of uh, people in the audience that are with hyper growth companies that are going through you know, this market that we're all living in and, and the success that you're enjoying. Um, words of wisdom to share with the audience from there. But let's start first with the, uh, the CSM function. And, and Umberto, if you could kick us off there, please. So individual contributors, kind of hands-on suggestions for them? Yes, people that have the CSM title today, sure. the vast majority of the audience today, yep. whether it's the, the VP of CSM that's, that's leading the yep. function and, and carrying the flag for what is new territory in many ways, yep. or the team members that are going through this evolution right. and, and leading the charge. Yep. Yeah, in my experience, oftentimes people in this customer success role come from a service type of background. And service is intrinsically a reactive uh, so you get an inquiry in and you respond, an inquiry in and you respond. And uh, my suggestion is to think about the world proactively, which is, you know, if you're just responding to what your customer is asking you, then are you really leading them to what they should be thinking about? You're probably not. So uh, in addition to responding when they call and not, you know, waiting a week for, to, to get back to them, um, you know, are you thinking, uh, do you know enough about their business to be able to suggest to them a better way to use your service product? Um, and if so, I think then the customer will see you not just as a service person, but really in, as an advisor who's continually helping them think about their own business. And what you bring to it is really your knowledge of the market, your technology, your product, your service that they cannot possibly have themselves, right? Because they're, you know, they got their job. 
and you're really engaging with them around, this is how I can help you make your world better. And, you know, uh, what, I, what I see is a challenge where the inbound conversations are kind of down here in the weeds, which is, you know, how do I use this feature? And it's really how do you take that conversation, which is, hey, I'm going to answer your question, but what are you trying to accomplish? What do you even want to know about this feature? What are you trying to do? Right? What are your business objectives? So that would be kind of macro uh, advice for me, from me. Okay. Jeff? I mean, the question is sort of about like measurement. How do we measure success? It, it, measure it, ideally improve it, and then, and then make that visible. There's, I think, challenges at all levels, and a lot of the breakouts and the discussions have been um, really thinking through systems, people, processes, metrics, um, to, to move the needle for the group and therefore the company. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll speak through. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've done is started measuring NPS uh, and rallied the company around it, not just, say, support or sales or account management. Um, how many people here measure NPS? Yeah, wow, see, like, it seems like a pretty common way, but I, I think the other thing is we've used it as a, as a tool to rally a lot of the departments and, and everybody who contributes to that concept. Um, and make it so that it is not one function in the company is responsible for you know customer success, but really use NPS as a tool for you know year round, twenty four seven, customer centricity uh, in our model and how we execute everything. And I do believe how many people in here are like some sort of SaaS service Cloud type business? business. A lot of people it seems. Seems like half right? or more. And, and we just fundamentally, we've internalized it. If your business is SaaS, what you're selling is trust. Right? You're saying, let us run this, and we're going to do a better job than you can do yourself. Right? And to make that sale requires trust. And so if everybody is on board with that is the fundamental product you're selling, and therefore you know, that customer happiness, that satisfaction, that long view of the relationship you have, and that trust that you earn and build up o over time, um, that's the most important thing that you have. That's like the most important asset of the company because that's fundamentally your product. Uh, and now we, you know, last year we started saying, and we're going to measure that in the form of, the, of, of NPS. Great. And then, uh, Jerry, before you answer, I'm going to offer the audience, I, we're going to have time for two questions. So. Um, think about any questions that you have, and after Jerry answers, uh, raise your hand, and if we can't get a mic to you, then, uh, then I'll call on you, yell it out, and uh, I'll repeat it so the audience can hear. But uh, right. Jerry, same question, please. All right. This, this is the wisdom question, right? Indeed. So, so basically, tech is two things. It's the product and the people, right? So my favorite saying has always been, at the end of the day, tech is about having the right product, and that's an incomplete statement. It's the right product at the right price of the right quality in the right market window supported to the satisfaction of the customer. So that's jacks are better to open, number one. Number two, it's all about the people, right? And so what do you sell in tech? You're selling intellectual property. That's what software is, intellectual property. And you're selling services and support. Intellectual property, service, and support come from the minds and the hands of people. So that's all you have in your companies, the people. Without them, you have nothing of value to give to the world. So it's all about treating people the right way. And so what's the right way to treat people? You know, I, I, I have to laugh. I see these. Um, I saw some of the San Francisco Business Times, greatest tech company for people, and they showed people in the office wearing Halloween costumes, throwing balls in the air, and drinking beer or something like, you know, like that's what employees want. Um, like uh, the, the best startup looks like a college dorm where they're, they're playing Animal House. Uh, and you read, I used to read Business Week, they had the, the greatest companies to work for, it'd be this long list of really horrible companies you never want to work for, and they'd be on the list because it was all about entitlements, the amount of pension, the amount of vacation pay, the amount of medical benefits, the 401k match, blah, blah, blah. What do you want when you go to work? So you want to be respected. You want to experience personal growth. You want to experience uh, career growth. The you want to have a collegial you experience with your coworkers. You want, you want, you, you want to be, uh, have some control over what you're doing. You want to be proud of your product. You want to be proud of the success of your customers. You want to feel like you belong to something of value. You want to have a family feel to it. And then if you can you know, sit on a bing bag chair and blow bubbles in the air, that's great too. But, the, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what it's all about. All righty, with that, raise your hand. Let's give these guys a hard question from the audience, please. Any questions uh, from the group? Raise your hand. I think we do have a mic over here. I see one up here. Uh, so uh, go, go ahead, ahead and yell it out if we can't give you the mic, please. Did 
you hear that? Uh, I heard part of it. Um, give him the microphone. Uh, oh, great. Uh, one more time. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. Um, so, Humberto, you specifically talked about if a salesperson sells them the moon and you don't take them to the moon. Right. How do you handle that? Can a VP or a, uh, of uh, customer success or a CSM veto a sale, or what happens? Yeah, it's a good question, and, and I, you know, that's why it's so important for the head of customer success to be a peer to the head of sales as opposed to you know subordinate, because otherwise that conversation will never happen, right? The head of sales is always going to win. Um, and what you do is you go back to the salesperson and just say, look, what did you sell them? And, you know, I, I'm under the fundamental belief that people in your company want to do the right thing. And if they're not doing it, it's because they don't know any better or because it hasn't been clear. So you, go, you, ask, you tell the salesperson, I will not accept this account from you until you go back and we have a meeting all together with a customer and you clar we clarify for the customer the fact that we can't go to the moon, but you know, we can go to Japan instead. Isn't that even a better place than the moon? Because there's no sushi on the moon. Um, so that's how we, we handle it. Um, and you know, I think um, you know, in many companies, I see that customer success somehow is viewed to be a lower function than sales. And you need to change that. You, know, you need the, the whole company to feel like, hey, your customer success is actually, thank you. Yeah. A round of applause for that. Friendly group. Because, because if you're a successful company, pretty soon more than half of your revenue is not going to come from sales, right? So it has to be at least as important. And you need both, right? You need to continue to have your customers be successful. Like Byron said, you know, good SaaS companies will have somewhere around 100%, maybe more, uh, retention, which means you can continue to be in business without any new logos, right, on a year to year basis, that's a great place to be. And then anything that you sell now is growth. That's where you want to be. If you, on the other hand, you have 60% or 40% revenue retention from your customer, you have to sell and the 60% gets bigger and bigger every year, you have a real problem. And before our last question, let me uh, show of hands. Uh, how many people by rule or process within the company as CSM executives are brought into a sales process before the deal is signed. Raise your hand if that's a formal company process. Okay, so under half, something to think about. Uh, more and more of our companies are implementing that as a pre-sales step to at least have that discussion before, not after the deal is signed. One last question for our esteemed panel. Uh, raise your hand if uh, someone's gutsy to, to give them a fastball uh, before we cut them loose here for the evening. Any last question? I see one in the middle there, please. <laughs> Why aren't there any women on the panel? It's a great question. Uh, and, uh, and I know the answer to that. There are 42 pure play public cloud companies. There are two female CEOs, um, Eliza, who's uh, at Jive, and Gail, who's at Constant Contact on the East Coast. Uh, we need more, plain and simply. We hope there's leaders in the audience to fill those seats. Thank you very much. Have fun tonight, everyone. <laughs>